Thanks, team. When I was in Michigan for uh, between Christmas and New Year's, I had the, the privilege of checking out a hospital for a couple days because of my asthma. And so they told me I'd be in there for five days, and I'm like, no, my flight's in three days, and they're non-refundable tickets, and so you need to do what you can to get me out of here. And so as I'm doing that, then the nurse comes back in. She goes, well, what are you doing? I'm going, sending some texts. She goes, you can't be working when you're in the hospital. And I wanted to say, lady, you're not my wife. <laughs> no, nothing against wives or, no, mother, mother. How about mother? You're not my mother. <laughs> you're not my daughter. Don't tell me what to do. Well, what I was doing is I was texting Bruce. Because I'm like, you know, Bruce, I'm here in the hospital. They say it could be five days. Uh, do you mind teaching today for me? And so Bruce graciously said yes, which was wonderful as I continued to recover with some asthma stuff. So Bruce, most of us know Bruce. He's been around here for years, helped bring me here, a friend of new life. So thank you, Bruce. Bruce's title, let me say this, is the regional executive for the far west region of the RCA. Now, I think that's the longest title I've seen for somebody. And so I'm going to ask Bruce, when he gets up here, to help unpack that a little bit so everybody knows what you're doing since you left here. And thank you, Bruce, for blessing us today. Thanks, sir. Appreciate it. <clears throat> of course, when uh, Juno called me, I was in the middle of a major cold. And I thought, oh, well, I should be over it by then. So uh, you'll need to bear with me a little bit if I cough and sputter. Uh, just a little bit. There's a six-foot no-speak zone, so we're safe. We took out the front row, made it more distant. Well, I'm glad to, to be here uh, again with you and uh, <coughs> talk about um, what it is to get a picture of something. Um, you know, one of the things about reading a book uh, that's magical and powerful is the fact that uh, as the author is describing a scene or a situation or even a person, uh, your mind paints this picture. And for those of you that are real avid readers, um, often it's very disappointing to see the movie. Now, some of us, you know, we wait for the movie. Um, it's just easier. But it's because the power of the mind. We, we want to see so desperately that we will fill in what we don't see. We will uh, create a backdrop that's not even written into the script because we have such a desire to see. And God knows that because he made us. And uh, he made us in a way to desire to see. Now, the question is, what do we put in the frame? What is the picture we create? Because we're all going to see something. We, we have to fill in the frame. My guess is none of you have empty frames hanging in your home. People would come over and go, now that's weird. So are you weird? Because that's weird, you know. So, um, but we want, to, we want to fill in that picture. And so this morning uh, I want to uh, visit and revisit um, the notion of what is new life's picture. And as Juno said, that's going to be unfolded in a number of weeks. But I want to revisit, visit, and for some people uh, to hear for the first time. What is our mission, vision, and values here? Why is it we do what we do the way we do it? Because there is, there is a method, there is a thought behind it. There's not a random act of deeds. Um, you, a good worship service will not feel planned. As you come to worship, you don't want to feel, okay, this is just a cookie cutter thing. You want to feel the spirit. You want to feel the freedom. You want to feel that. But do you realize how much time, energy, resources, and planning go in to allow a fluidity of worship and freedom. So as we talk here today, there's a lot of energy and time that's gone in to the words that describe New Life's vision and mission. 
and what it is that the elders and deacons of the church have said, we believe. And this is what drives us. And so let's take a look at that and let me open with prayer. (coughs) Father, we pause here today and we know that you are the one who has created the frame. You are the one that's created the context in which our eyes, the the eyes of our heart, the, the, the eyes of our soul long to fill in. And Lord, as we we listen to what you have presented to the church, may we hear what you would have us to hear. May we see what you would have us to see. Because Father, we know at the end of it all, we should see you more clearly, love you more sincerely. And so Father, we pray that in our time together, Uh, These things will be true to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in most churches I've worked with through the years, I always say January is a good time to kind of revisit the vision and mission of a church. And the reason is because we forget. We're forgetful people. 227 times in 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 the scriptures, it says, remember, Remember, you know, we've talked before, but when God did a work, he'd say, pile up the rocks. So when you go to and fro and the kids say, why are those rocks all piled up? You tell the story. You remember what God did there. And so today we're going to remember. One famous pastor says, vision leaks. Vision leaks. So it's not like, well, I've heard it, got it. The question is, do we live it? Do we see it? Does it consume God's framework for our life together, individually, and as a community? Well, the first aspect we want to look at is our mission. And the mission of new life is to join in God's work on earth by making disciples and equipping them to be obedient Christ followers. Mission is what we do. What is it we're about? We want to join God's work. It's not our work. We didn't get together and decide, what do we want to do? We gather together and say, as Christ followers, as as men and women who are called to follow Christ, to, to live and to love like him, what is it we would do in this community in these days? What is God calling us to see and move toward. And so we join him, which means we need to submit, we need to hear, we need to quiet ourselves. We need to, in the context of community groups, and in the context of individual prayer and reflection and quiet times, seek God's clarity. How do we join him? I don't want to be a part of a church that says, we want to do this. Oh God, please bless it. I want to be a part of a church that says, here's what's God's blessing, and we want to join him in it. You want to be a part of a church like that? Of course you do. (laughs) Of course you do. We don't want to be asking God to bless that which is of our own desire, which is painted because of our own picture. So we need to be a church that is making disciples and equipping them to be obedient Christ followers. We make disciples. There's no age limits in Scripture. There's no racial or ethnic boundaries in Scripture. There are no economic ranges in Scripture. We do this for the people we touch in our lives. Wherever God takes us and leads us, we are to be salt and light. And not only do we penetrate into our communities and neighborhoods, but God will attract people. People have come to this place, and some of you are sitting here that you don't know why you came. You just felt you needed to go, and you were drawn here. 
So we need to be out there, but we need to be committed to equipping one another to be loving servants with one another. Jesus said in Matthew 28, the end of his earthly ministry, after his resurrection, as he's gathered with his disciples, all authority has been given to me in heaven on earth. Jesus is saying, I have the authority to say what I'm about to say. It's not my authority, it's been given to me. Because of his faithfulness on the cross, he was resurrected, given the authority as head of the church. Jesus is not on the board. He is the head of the church. He is the one to whom we all follow. He says, go therefore, because I have this authority, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, all people groups, all languages. In these days for New Life Community Church, the nations are here. The nations are in this community. It used to be you had to go to the nations but God has been bringing the nations to us. So we welcome and we go. All nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. I will be with you always, everywhere, at all time. Jesus is with us. He's the one that has given us his authority and power to be about his ministry and mission. We are a multicultural, multi-generational community. And so we need to do many different things all around the one person of Jesus Christ. Because the only thing that allows a multicultural community to move forward and to thrive and to grow is a strong focus on the word of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because whether you're black or white, Asian or whatever, you need Jesus. But if we preach our own picture, a lot of people don't see what I see. They don't want what I want but we all need Jesus. So we need to be a community that's lifting up the gospel, lifting up the power of God's word. So we have a mission, but I want to talk for a second now about vision. Vision uh, in scripture, in Proverbs 29, 18, says, where there is no vision, the people perish. In other words, when people can't see, it's devastating. So much devastating, it uses the word perish. People need to see where God is moving. If we are Christ followers, we've all as kids played follow the leader, but if we're followers, we need to see the one we're following, don't we? We need to see how is he moving? How is he relating to those around him? How does he extend grace? How does he humbly speak truth? How does he bring healing? How does he comfort? We need to see him as the model for how we behave. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Other translations of Proverbs says, where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. In other words, when there's not clarity of focus, when we're not all looking at the same picture, people create their own picture. And pretty soon, we got a group of people going 20 different directions. We pretty soon create our own church and our own image. That's not what God calls us to. Another version says, without guidance from God, law and order disappear. You see, without God, we have no centrality, no focal point. Without clarity and guidance from God, order disappears. It leads to chaos. It leads to 
people being unrestrained because they do that which is right in their own eyes, not what is necessarily in best interest of the community. Another version says, if people can't see what God is doing, they stumble over themselves. That's powerful. The power of vision makes a difference between what can be developed into an experienced as unity. You can't create unity. Everybody says, oh, we ought to be one. You can't create unity. Unity is a natural byproduct of living like Jesus. Unity is a natural byproduct by all seeing the same thing. Our oneness is not in the way we relate and do ministry. Our oneness is about why we do ministry and to who we serve. Are you hearing me? That this is when, see, when the speaker says that, you say, yeah, yeah, I hear you. Okay. If you're a good Baptist in your background, you can say an amen, you know, that kind of, kind of thing. I won't go Ryan's uh, distance on amens, but, you know, we'll, we'll do it. <coughs> the vision of new life is to see a growing number of Christ followers creating communities marked by reconciliation, peace, justice, and hope. Why we do the mission? If we were faithfully committed and fulfilled our mission, we would then realize the reality of the vision. The vision is what we see. It's the picture of a preferable future. Well, how are we going to do that? That's our mission. We believe if we do this, we'll eventually see this. What is the vision? To see a growing number of Christ followers. The church will be growing. We'll see more and more people committed to following Jesus. How can that happen? When we lift up the same Jesus, when we all have the same picture, it's very easy. But if we lift up pictures of our own Jesus, our own agendas, then, then it gets very confusing. And people say, I don't know, I don't see Jesus. And people need him. More and better disciples, living and loving like Jesus, coming together in faith communities. This is what we really want to see. We're not trying to grow the church here. What, what New Life does isn't about being bigger and better than the church here or the congregation over there. We want to be faithful to the picture God's given us. We believe Jesus wants more and better followers. So if we follow him, I would expect to see more and better followers. That means some of us who have been here, we need to keep growing to be better followers. For some of you that don't know Jesus, you haven't said, yes, I'm going to follow him. You need to check in. And hopefully today, in these next couple of weeks, you'll get a clearer picture of who this Jesus is. But these are communities marked by reconciliation. In 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19, we're told now, all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That sounds like follow the leader. Jesus was reconciled us and he wants us to do the same with others. Do as I do. Are we reconciling people or are we judging people? Are we reconciling people to what I think you ought to be? Or are we reconciling people to Jesus, to the forgiveness of their sins, to the work of the cross? We've been given the ministry of reconciliation, namely, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, their sins. He didn't say, oh, I don't know, dude, you got like one big pile of sin. Uh, you know, I can let in people with little piles. I just can't let in people with big piles. Jesus didn't count their trespasses. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. 
we're committed to be a church of reconciling relationships with one another, with God, and to following him. Communities of reconciliation and peace. In Romans 12, 18, it says, if possible, if possible, so far as it depends on you, not you and your buddies, you and your family, insofar as it depends on you, be at peace with all people. Now, I, I don't know, I get hurt, I get ticked, I get upset, and, you know, I sit there going, well, gee, I don't know, they're, they're kind of a dirt bag, and gee, they weren't very kind, and, you know, and I get, get all my little excuses all lined up. But I have no excuses. I just have my own sin and my own rebellion and my own pride and my own ego that keeps me from forgiving others, for seeking peace. I don't want to seek peace. I mean, if they say, yeah, it's okay, that ticks me off. It's like they get a free pass. They shouldn't get a pass. So we want to become the judge. We want to become the executioner. We want to become things that God never called us to be. And in Hebrews 12, 14, we're told, pursue peace with all people and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Wow. You know what? That's, that's a fancy theological word, sanctification. <laughs> that, that's, that's a theological word that simply means the process of becoming more and more like Jesus. We're, we're saved but we're not necessarily like Jesus. Sanctification is what happens after salvation. Salvation is that step where I, I come into the presence and relationship of Christ. I receive him into my life. And we're saved. Our sins are forgiven. Past, present, and future. We're free. Sanctification is now the process of learning how to follow Jesus. I become a Christ follower through his word and his ways, through his spirit. We're to be at peace. And then communities that are marked by justice. In Micah, book in the Old Testament, we're told that he has told you what is good. <laughs> I love this again. What is the author saying? Don't you remember? He's told you what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? I mean, we've all asked that in different ways. God, what do you want from me? Well, to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with your God. We do justice. We don't talk about justice. We do justice. And where we see injustice, we speak against it. We love kindness. That means we be kind. You can't say you love kindness and, and gossip. You can't say you love kindness and be mean-spirited. If you love kindness, you will be kind. And we walk humbly, which means we be humble people. None of us have all the truth. None of us have the experience that explains everybody's journey, that is the key that unlocks everybody's story. Mm -mm. So we walk humbly. And then communities that are marked by hope. And, I, and in Ephesians 1, we find the word saying, I pray that your eye, the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. The eyes of your heart may be enlightened. What does that mean? I pray that you'll get the picture. I pray that you'll see through the eyes of your heart that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory and his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. We have great hope in him. And we ought to be the most hopeful people on this planet. Because we know who wins. We know who is Lord. 
We don't understand all his ways. We don't understand his timing. But I can rest in the fact that the Lord of my life is in control. So to summarize, our vision of new life is to see a growing number of Christ followers creating communities at work, at homes, church, wherever God would have us, marked by reconciliation, peace, and justice. Now, the three key ways that New Life has committed itself to get at the vision and mission is what we've called the big three. And just to remind ourselves that one of the ways to build these communities is in community. And we call those life groups. They're intentional, learning, loving, and living groups. It's when you sit in someone's home, across the table, across the couch, and you know when someone's not there. You know the names of their kids. You know what they and their family are going through, and you're there for one another. And you do that authentically. The second approach is missional. And we could say mission, ministry and mission, where we're discovering everyday opportunities to impact people around us. You see, Jesus was always thinking about the people around him. And in each situation, one of the things that frustrates many people, they want to systematize Jesus' approach. And you can't, because he dealt with each person uniquely. So if there's any consistency in Jesus, it's that he's always dealt with them individually, uniquely, at the heart of their issue. Because he saw them. And even when he couldn't see them, he told his disciples, don't hinder these people, let them come. Jesus could hear. So we need to be missional. And we need to be about the transformation of our own lives and the transformation work or sanctification in the lives of all God's people. And then there's home life, an intentional aspect that new life is committed to saying, how can we help you? The place where you put your pillow, the place where you sleep at night, how can that place be a place of faith and nurture every day in little ways? in growing ways. As Juno said, you don't have to open your house and have a bunch of people over. Some of you, that, ah, that scares you to death. You're not wired like that. That's okay. But how does home become a place of faith nurture? Well, <coughs> I want to just talk briefly here about um, how and what it is we believe. In Western culture, you can believe something and uh, know something and be totally unaffected by it. It it doesn't impact your day-to-day. You believe it. It's, It's a thought. But that's not the case in God's kingdom. To say you believe in him is more than an intellectual assent. In the Old Testament, in the King James Version, when they were translating that, it says that Adam knew Eve. Now, Adam knew Eve. Oh, yeah, and then she gave birth. See, the the Hebrew word is the word to know. He knew her personally, intimately. They were one. Do we know God? Do we know Jesus personally, intimately? Are we one? We believe that a new life, what we believe, has consequences. Because what you believe, as the scripture says, what a person thinks, so are they. So what do we believe? It reflects how we behave. And the belief statements are uh, on the website, and I just want to hit a a couple of these. um, Because... 
what we believe in, 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 at New Life is written in a way that says, therefore we will. Because this is true, because we believe this, we will behave a certain way. The only real God is the creator and loving ruler of all. Therefore, we will obey God and respect his creation. So a question is, how am I doing in obeying God and respecting his creation, his creation of the earthly world, his creation of his people, all people, those that know him and those that don't? We believe that father, the Father loves all people and seeks a restored relationship with everyone. Therefore, we will reflect the Father's love for all people in everything we do. There's a growth edge. There's a challenge for all of us. Are we loving everyone? Do we have conditions upon our graciousness? Do we reflect God's love in everything we do? I have to confess, I don't. I don't. But that's why I have to come back to something like this, to recalibrate, to rethink, to get that picture once again. Because that is what I want. I would love all of you to say, Bruce, you, you're, you're a model in that. Now, don't be kind, because I know I'm not. And... Um, some of you won't be kind, so <laughs> you'll remind me that I'm not. We believe that Jesus paid the price for sins of all. Therefore, we will do whatever it takes to make Jesus known so people can experience a restored relationship to Christ. That's why this church does many things, from a food distribution to opening homes in small groups by having Super Bowl parties. You can say, well, that doesn't seem very spiritual. Well, I don't know if giving food is very spiritual either. But if you're following Jesus, you see him at the Super Bowl party, and you'll see him at the food distribution, and you'll see him in small groups, you'll see him in workplaces, you'll see him in classrooms, because that's where Jesus is, and that's where he wants us to be. We believe that the Holy Spirit lives in Christ's followers, empowering them to be purposeful in ways that please God. Therefore, we'll draw on the Holy Spirit in all aspects of our lives. I wonder how many times we do things out of the flesh, throw a verse on it, and call it of God. Is the Holy Spirit truly prompting me to speak? Is the Holy Spirit prompting me to be silent? Is the Holy Spirit leading me this way or this way? We need to grow in hearing the Holy Spirit. Because when we are in a community like this and we say the Spirit's saying this, Spirit's saying this, one thing I do know, you don't have a different Holy Spirit than I do. We all have the same Holy Spirit. And if we're not on the same page, someone is not listening. And so we need to keep coming together to hear the word together. We believe the church is a sent community. The church, the Greek word for the church in the New Testament is ekklesia, ek, exit, out of. Exit, ek, ekklesia means called ones. The church are the called out ones. We're called out from the world. We're to be different, not because we're weird and different, but because we love differently. We listen differently. We serve differently. We're motivated differently. We have a different picture. And it ought to affect everything. We need to be recalibrated. We need to calibrate our lives to that. We believe in prayer. Christ followers communicating with God in all things, yielding to his leading and will. Therefore, we pray regularly and often about all things. I wonder if you're a little like me, a little more action-oriented. You get a thought, feels good, check with my gut, seems intuitive, go with it. Pray? Oh, well, um, no, I guess I, I didn't really stop to check in with my Lord. 
Prayer affects things, and we can't be affected his way. We can't be affected to see what he wants us to see if we don't slow down and spend time in prayer. So the reality is, if we do not believe these things, we will not complete our mission and vision. How we behave, if we misbehave, we will not fulfill the the mission or the vision. So behavior, what we believe, is a foundational energy and mindset out of which we become faithful Christ followers. But in reality, we can believe all these things and not do them. You can nod your head to everything we say we believe. I believe that. I believe that. But are you contributing to what God has called the New Life Community Church to by obeying, by following the picture. If Christ followers don't live them out, we won't usher in the kingdom of God. We won't experience what Jesus has intended us to experience. So, We're going to move into a a time of reflection here. And I guess I I want to ask, you know, what is it you need to do today? Um, As you begin a new year, many of you have made resolutions. Some of you have made a resolution never to do any more resolutions. Um, But the question is, what do you need to do today? What do you need to let go of? What's in your backpack that is not of Jesus, and it's keeping you from following him. What do you need to confess to? What do you need to say, Lord, forgive me? I I was wrong. What do you need to repent of? What do you need to actually give up, turn away, and actually start moving in a different direction? What do you need to commit to? Maybe you've just been going along, going with the program. But what is the Holy Spirit saying to you today about what you need to commit to? What is it you need to begin to engage in? Many opportunities to connect. Are you connecting? Or is it all activity? What do you need to submit to? And for some of you, who do you need to submit to? In order to be a more obedient Christ follower in 2015. I know it's in your heart. I know it's your desire. And none of us can do it alone. That's why he brings us together in community. But we need to love and serve each other toward his picture, not our own. So, as we move into a time of reflection here, and as the worship team comes back up, you may just need to stay where you are and just pray. Maybe you want to get on your knees and pray. Receive communion to remember. To light a candle is a reminder that you are going to be praying in some new ways. I don't know what it is that Spirit may be having you to do, but obey. Jesus, we thank you for this time. We thank you that you don't forget us and that you don't leave us alone because you love us as you do. So, Father, in this time here, may we do what your Spirit is prompting each of us to do for your sake, for your glory, for your vision and mission. In Jesus' name, amen.